Welcome back everyone to chapter 13. This is section number four, motion in space. We're talking about velocity and acceleration here uh, in this section. You can see we're jumping around a little bit. We were just in 13.2, now we're in 13.4. Um, oftentimes these are kind of grouped together to some extent, so that's kind of why the jumping around. And we have all the information that we really need in order to start doing things with it, right? Actually applying it. So this is a nice almost application section. So I would like to define right, a velocity, a speed, and acceleration for vector functions. We're going to review Newton's second law of motion and use it in vector calculus. And then finally, right, we're going to get a little bit of practice applying these things. Um, I want to mention, though, that if you read in the textbook, first of all, good for you, uh, but we are skipping the sections about tangential and normal components of acceleration, right? So there's this extra topic. We're also skipping Kepler's laws of planetary motion, which are very interesting, but they just won't come up on our quizzes, exams, finals, stuff like this. But if you're interested in learning more about how you can apply this vector calculus stuff, that would be some good reading for you uh, that's at the right level. All right. So in this section, we're going to always use this r of t, our nice vector function here, to be position, right? So r of t is going to be a position vector of a particle moving through space at a particular time. So this t, I want you to think of it as time, and r of t, right, this is a position, right, a vector position. So the claim is, if you're thinking about this as position, then we can define the velocity, and this will be a velocity vector, which will be denoted v of t, and again, this is a vector uh, at time t, and this is given by the derivative of position, kind of like it was back in our Calc 1 days. Now, likewise, speed of a particle given at time t is going to be equal to the absolute value of velocity, sort of, right? So this is a vector, though. Velocity is a vector. So when I take this absolute value thing, really, this is the magnitude or the length of the vector, right? So this is actually with the square root and each component being squared, summed together sort of deal. So this isn't technically an absolute value anymore. This is you know, the length or the magnitude of a vector. All right, we'll get practice with that. And then finally, the acceleration of a particle is defined by, well, this is going to be the derivative of our velocity vector, or it's going to be the second derivative of our position vector, right? Okay, so there are some nice definitions about velocity, speed, and acceleration. Let's move now into Newton's second law of motion, which simply states, right, that force force vector maybe at a particular time is equal to mass times acceleration. Mass times acceleration. And now this is an acceleration vector and maybe this changes with time. So it depends on what the t is. Now the mass, we're not saying this changes with time. So we're going to keep our masses constant in this class. So it'll be a little bit nice. Okay. Um, in this class, we're going to do many two-dimensional problems with the force of gravity. So that is, with force of gravity, right, this is going to be negative, so mass, so negative because it's pulling down, right, uh, and this is some gravitational constant, g, and it's in this j direction, right, so it's being pulled down. If we want to go ahead and use the actual vector notation here, right, force of gravity doesn't do anything left or right, so notice there's no i component, but then again, it's down, mass times, and the acceleration due to gravity is denoted with this g, right? And so, again, the typical g value on Earth is 9.8 meters per second squared. Uh, sometimes we round this up for, right, we don't have calculators, so sometimes we just say 10 meters per second squared uh, for nice calculations, or 32 feet per second squared, right? And so this is something that you uh, have to go out and measure, and it turns out this is what it is. Uh, on the surface of the Earth. But if you're on the Moon or on Mars or something like this, right, this gravitational constant is different. And so we just kind of usually denote it with G uh, until I tell you which planet we're on and what are our units in, right? Are they in feet per second squared or are they in meters per second squared? What are we using here? Okay, equivalently, if you just wanted a statement about acceleration, that would mean that acceleration is this negative GJ. So it's this negative 
uh, acceleration due to gravity in the negative j direction, right down. Uh, and then, or you can represent this as zero comma negative, uh, oops, negative g. Yes, that's right. So that's our acceleration, and then when you multiply by mass, that gives you the force, right? Okay, so let's see, now that we have all of our definitions and stuff, let's actually use this for a nice practice problem. Okay, a projectile is fired with a muzzle speed of 150 meters per second at an angle of elevation of 45 degrees, and it's at a position 10 meters above ground level. So I'd like to figure out what is our acceleration, what is our velocity, and what is our position. Okay, so, and I gave you the right order here. Let's go ahead and first of all figure out acceleration. Well, as we know from above, acceleration is going to be 0, comma, negative g. So 0, comma, negative g. And here our units are meters per second and 10 meters. So we're going to be in this, we're going to use meters per second squared, right? Otherwise we'd have to convert from feet to meters and stuff like this. So I'm going to use 10 meters per second squared. So my g is going to be 10 in this case. So 10, negative 10. So that is my acceleration. Now let's go ahead and figure out our velocity. Well, since acceleration is the derivative of velocity, if I'd like to know what our velocity is, well, I'm going to have to integrate, right? I'm going to take the antiderivative to get to velocity. So again, velocity is the integral of acceleration. And so this is going to be the integral of 0, comma, negative 10. And so this is a constant vector. So when I integrate this, well, I'm going to have my constant vector times t, right? That's how I would integrate, plus some constant of integration, right? And the big thing here is that this is a vector, right? We are going to have constants in both the x direction and the y direction. So it's sometimes you could just go ahead and denote this by its components. Maybe I'll call this C1 and C2 to really denote that you need a constant of integration for both the x component and the y component. Now also, I'm going to maybe work upwards, so it'll be a little bit strange here. But sometimes you like to represent this, you know, kind of all simplified down into just one vector. So if you did that, right, 0 times 0, sorry, 0 times t would be 0. And then we're going to add C1, so C1 to that. So that's going to be 0 plus C1. Our first component will just be C1. Then in our second component, we're going to have negative 10t, right? Again, because with the scalar multiplication, you do this t to each component. So negative 10t plus C2, right? Plus this constant of integration. And now this is all represented in one nice vector. So you can write your answer like this if you'd like. But either way is fine. OK. Now we have a little bit of work cut out for us because we need to figure out what is the C1 and the C2, right? What are these constants of integration? And so we're going to use this information about velocity, right? So it's at a speed of 150 meters per second, and we know the angle of elevation, 45 degrees. So let me go ahead. I'm going to draw out maybe a picture here. So we have our maybe initial velocity here. So this will be our initial velocity v at time 0. Now we know the speed of this thing, aka the length or the magnitude of this, is 150. And I want to know what is the x component, right? How much over do we have? What is the x component? And what is the y component? How much up and down? So that's going to be, well, we know that this angle of elevation is 45 degrees, or that's pi over 4. So using that, we should be able to solve for, again, what is our y component and what is our x component. So, and we know that, again, this length right here of this side is 150. So I'm going to go ahead and use my good old trig functions, right? So for instance, if I use sine of theta, so sine of 45 degrees should be equal to opposite over hypotenuse, which is 150. Now sine of 45 is root 2 over 2. And so now we get that is equal to y over 150. And let's go ahead and multiply by 150 on both sides. So 150 goes over here. Let me just erase this. 
And so I get my y component for my initial velocity is going to be equal to, what, 75 times root 2. Likewise, for my x component, maybe I'll use cosine, right? Cosine of 45 degrees should be equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. Adjacent over hypotenuse. So cosine of 45 is also root 2 over 2. Now let me go ahead and multiply by 150 on both sides. So that'll nicely cancel out here, and I'll just have x on this side. And so I'll have 75 times root 2. So now I have my x component and my y component for my velocity, or really my initial velocity, right? My velocity at time 0. So that is, when I plug in 0 for t, well, I can do that, right? If I plug in 0 for t, I should get, uh, I wanted blue here, v of 0, which again, we know the x component is going to be 75 root 2, and the y component will also be 75 root 2 because of our work up here. And this should be equal to, well, here's our velocity uh, equation, right, or our velocity vector, and let's plug in 0 everywhere I see a t. Well, that's going to be c1, and then when I plug in 0 for this t, I'll get just c2. So in this case, we figured out that c1 has to be 75 root 2, and we figured out that c2 also has to be 75 root 2. So this gives us a way to simplify, uh, or to plug in for our c1 and our c2. This is going to be 75 root 2, comma, negative 10 t plus, and c2 is also 75 root 2. All right, so that is going to be our velocity equation, solve for our c's and everything. The last bit is, well, position, right? So position, r of t, well, this is going to be the antiderivative of velocity. So I'm going to integrate my velocity, 75 root 2, comma, negative 10t plus 75 root 2 dt. And again, this is going to be the same thing as just integrating each component. So I'm going to show you a different way than maybe this last one up here, because I want you to get used to kind of either one of these as, for, as far as integrating vectors uh, go. So I'm going to integrate each component. So in my first component, again, this is a nice constant here. So this is going to be 75 root 2. And when you integrate that constant, you're going to get a t. When you integrate negative 10t, well, that's going to be negative 5t squared. And don't forget about the 75 root 2. So 75 root 2t. And then each one of those has a constant of integration, right? So plus a c1 and a c2. Or if you'd like to, I mean, these are not going to be the same things as up here. So maybe in order to really denote that these are different things, maybe you want to use d1 and d2 or something like this to really denote that these are different. Right? So d1 and d2, some other constants of integration. OK, how can we solve for those? Well, we know that the position uh, is 10 meters above ground level initially. Right? So initially, it's 10 meters above ground level. I would write that as, well, we have some initial x position. It's not to the left or to the right anything, but it is 10 meters above the ground. So I would write this as the vector 0, 10. So again, initially, our position is at 0, 10. So you notice this was a lot easier. We didn't have to do any of this triangle stuff up here like we did for initial velocity. And this initial position was a lot easier in this case. So in this case, again, the initial position is equal to 0, 10. And now if we go ahead and we plug in, again, t is equal to 0. That's time 0 is initially, right? I would get here 0, comma, all of this ends up being 0, plus d1 and d2. And so we get that d1 is equal to 0, and we get that d2 is equal to 10. So again, everywhere I see a d1, I'm going to plug in 0. Everywhere I see a d2, I'm going to plug in 10. So that gives me my position is equal to and 75 root 2 times t. Now I'm adding that to d1. So that's going to be technically plus 0. 
which anything plus zero is just itself. And then comma, right, next component, negative 5t squared plus 75 root 2t. And then to this component, we need to add d2. So I'm going to add 10. And there is our initial, uh, sorry, there is our position uh, vector function. So position, velocity, and acceleration. Those were the three that I needed to find. All right, part B, what is the projectile's maximum height? And for this, it helps to kind of draw out a picture. We have to think about this one for a second. Uh, what is a projectile's maximum height? So I'm gonna go ahead and draw a ball here and write, or you know, whatever this, uh, maybe a bullet or something that's shot uh, at this initial elevation of 45 degrees, it's off the ground, and then it kind of goes down, it probably hits, right? Something like this. Okay, so the idea here is that uh, kind of at each time, let's think about this ball a little bit and what its velocity is doing. So acceleration, right, due to gravity, it's pulling the ball down. But in this case, right, we don't have any consideration for wind resistance or anything like this. So if I think about the ball's velocity in the x component, right, the x component, it just continues to travel right a certain fixed distance for each second. So, and we can see that in our velocity, right? It's just a straight up 75 times root two. It's not changing at all, right? The velocity in the x direction doesn't change. However, in the y direction, right, you can see that it's on its way up. So its velocity, right, it has some positive component to it. And now it's positive, but it's a little bit less, right? It's kind of leveling out a little bit. Positive, just a little bit less, maybe even zero there. But now the velocity starts being negative, more negative, more negative, because the, it's going down, right? And in particular, you can see that at t equals zero, Right, it starts off with a very positive velocity, and then at t equals 1, well, you have to subtract 10 from that. And then at t equals 2, you subtract another 10. And then at t equals 3, you subtract another 10, right? And eventually, it starts going down some. So the big thing here is that at this maximum height, let's say right here, at this maximum height, the y velocity is exactly between, right, here's all the positives, positive y velocities. Here's all the negatives. And so at that maximum height, the y velocity is zero, okay? And this is actually an idea that we brought up back in Calc 1, uh, but we did it with just single variable, right? We would give you just stuff about heights. We wouldn't give you anything with the x's, just heights. And when the, that velocity was equal to zero, that's when we achieve our maximum height. So in this case, when the y component of velocity is equal to zero, so I'm gonna do zero is equal to negative 10t plus 75 root two. If I can solve that, which I should be able to using algebra, let's go ahead and rearrange and divide by 10 and I would get, oh, let's see, 75 divided by five will be 15, divide that by another two, so it's gonna be 15 halves times root two. All right, so that's going to be exactly when the projectile reaches its maximum height. But I want to know what is the projectile's maximum height. So I have a t value, and I want to know what is its maximum height. Well, that's a position, right? A maximum height is a position. It's not an x position, but it's a y position, right? So we're going to go ahead and take this t value and plug it into the y coordinate of our position vector. So this is going to be, what is the maximum height? Well, it'll be negative five, and then t squared, so that's gonna be 15 halves root two squared, plus 75 root two times our t value, 15 over two root two, plus 10. And remember that our position here well, that's given in meters, right? So the units here are meters. And we can simplify this a little bit down if you have some extra time, right? And you actually, you know, put in the effort, right? This can actually be simplified down to a nice 1,145 halves. And that's a decimal of, you know, 572.5. So 572.5 meters or 1,145 halves uh, meters. All right, so that is the maximum 
height. So again, the main thing that you want to take away from this, in order to figure out when the maximum height is, you take the velocity, or the y component of velocity, and you set that equal to zero. Because when the y velocity of component, uh, sorry, the y component of velocity is zero, that's when you achieve that maximum height, and that gives you the time. But so that would ask when is the projectile uh, reach its maximum height. But if you want to know what is the projectile's maximum height, well, you take that time and you feed it into the y component of position, right? Because the, that will give you the height. All right. Finally here, or I guess I have kind of, this is a two-parter here. Where does the projectile hit the ground? And then what is the projectile speed on impact? So where does the projectile hit the ground? Well, hitting the ground, this means that you have a height of zero, right? So if you have a height of zero, well, where is your height? Well, height is going to be the y component of position. So I would like this to be equal to zero. So I set zero equal to negative 5 t squared plus 75 root 2 t plus 10. And now you can see that this is kind of some nasty quadratic looking thing, right? And so luckily we know a quadratic formula to be able to solve this. Maybe even before I do that, I should divide by 5 on each side. Maybe even uh, negative 5. So first of all, if I take 0 and I divide that by negative 5, that's still 0. If I divide negative 5 t squared by negative 5, I'd get t squared. Here I'd get negative 15 root 2 t. And here I would get negative 2. So that's just me dividing by negative 5 across the board right, to make this a little bit nicer. All right, so again, quadratic formula time. Uh, that's going to be t is equal to, uh, let's see, negative b. So that's going to be 15 root 2 plus or minus the square root of b squared. So let's see, 15 squared I think is 225, and root 2 squared is going to be 2. So that's going to be 450 minus 4ac divided by 2a. So that's just going to be 2. Now in this case you can see uh, you have two answers, right? A positive and a negative. If you were to kind of go backwards in time here, right, you can see that there's a negative time where it theoretically would have been at the ground, right? But we're going to take the positive time, right? So we're going to want the plus in this case. So this is going to be t is equal to 15 root 2 plus the square root of 458 all divided by 2. Now, this is a nasty time, admittedly. Uh, if you go ahead and you plug this into your calculator, uh, the claim is that this is just equal to around 21.3 seconds. So I'm going to say around 21.3 seconds. There we go. And again, this is a time, so this is seconds, right? Or maybe SEC for seconds. So if you want to stay exact, you would plug in, you know, this nasty T value. Uh, we're going to be a little bit less precise and just use 21.3 uh, in this case. All right, so this is the time in which the projectile hits the ground, right? It has a height of zero. So again, we set the height or the y component of position equal to zero. We tried to solve when does that happen, and we got this particular time. Okay, but it asks where does the projectile hit the ground? Well, where is a position, right? So first of all, we already know, well, if it's on the ground, the y coordinate of it should be zero. But the question is maybe where is the x coordinate? How far out did it go? So I would like to take this time here and plug it in to the x position, right? So here it is right here. And so if I go ahead and I plug that in, uh, let's see, I'll get 75 times root 2 times my t value. And again, here I'm going to be a little bit less precise and use a calculator, but certainly you could just keep it all in exact form. It'll be a little bit messy, but you just enter it in that way. Uh, so we're going to do the 21. 21.3, oops, 21.3 is my t value. And if you plug this in and multiply it out using a calculator or something, you'll get 2,259. Actually, it's really, really close to 2,260. So I'm going to go ahead and here and put 2,260. 
and that would be meters, right? So this would be meters. So it's at a height of zero, but it's 2,260 meters away from where it was kind of initially shot, right? Where this projectile was initially shot. So this is where the projectile hits the ground. And then our final question, what is the projectile's speed on impact? Well, again, we know when it impacts the ground, that's at 21.3 seconds. Now let's go ahead and plug that into our speed equation, right? So speed is going to be equal to this magnitude or this length of velocity. So that's going to be the square root of, and let's go back up, and we need to take our velocity components. So 75 root 2 squared, 75 root 2 squared, plus, and now we're going to have negative 10t plus 75, negative 10t plus 75 root 2 quantity squared. That would be our general speed equation. And now we would like it at this very specific time. So velocity, our speed is the square root of, and now this is going to be 75 uh, root 2 squared plus negative 10 times 21.3 that's our time of impact plus 75 root 2 squared all under the square root and again if this was like a web work problem or something like this you could enter your answer like this and just leave it as is uh, but if we go ahead and we plug this into a calculator we'll get an answer of 150.6 one five and well this is a speed so it's going to be in meters per second so you can kind of see here while well, your initial speed was again 150 meters per second and it's gone up a while then it's gone down it's went kind of 10 meters below where you maybe initially started so it kind of makes sense that it'd be a little bit faster and indeed it is it is a little bit faster than what we started so this is the projectile speed on impact. Again, the technique here is what I want you to steal from this, is that we need to calculate out speed, and then we need to know our time of impact, right? When does it hit the ground? So you take that time, and you plug it into your speed equation, and that'll give you the speed on impact. All right, I think that's enough for this video. Go ahead, take a break. You can try a few Weber comms, and I'll see you guys in class.